FIT Talks is the Fashion Institute of Technology's oral history program directed by Karen Trivet, Head of Special Collections in the Library. My name is Phyllis Dillon. Today, we'll be talking with Fern Malice. Fern Malice is the person who helped transform the fashion business in the 1990s from a loosely connected group of small and big companies into a business sector with cultural clout influence and a distinctive identity when she ran and professionalized the CFDA as it showcased and centralized fashion shows in the tents at Bryant Park. As senior VP at IMG, along with running New York Fashion Week, she also led new fashion weeks at cities all over the world, elevating fashion into popular culture internationally. She has participated in all parts of the industry and has a very unique vantage point to observe and understand its recent history. Aside from her interesting and pivotal jobs, she has pioneered fashion education and entertainment for Sirius Radio and at the 92nd Street Y. Based on her Y program interviews, her book, Fashion Lives, Fashion Icons with Fern Malice, is a profound record of the career achievements of 19 fashion leaders. She serves on advisory boards, been a pioneering fundraiser for AIDS and breast cancer, and received many awards. She's on the board of directors of FIT, received two Lifetime Achievement Awards from Pratt and FIT, and was inducted into the Business of Fashion Hall of Fame in 2014. Fern, first, when did you become interested in fashion? Oh, God knows when. Um... I think I've always just been surrounded by it. Um, my dad worked in the garment center, so I was always growing up listening to stories about the fashion industry. I always loved clothing. Um, he was in the scarf business, so I played with scarves all the time and had thousands of them. Um, I, you know, it's just something that I always loved. My mother was not particularly fashion conscious, but she had, she had great style. Um, it was just something that just I just, just enjoyed. I loved clothing. I loved dressing up. And then you won a coveted guest editorship, editorship at Mademoiselle Magazine in the late 60s. Very uh, late 60s. Yeah. The end of the 60s. <laughs> end of the 60s. Now, I know how significant that is, but a lot of our younger uh, listeners may not. Can you tell us about that college board program? Uh, Mademoiselle's um, guest editorship, editorship program was really legendary. Um, I, I should know how many years it lasted, but it was quite a long time. Um, and it was something where Mademoiselle at the time was Condé Nast's, really one of the leading magazines for women. It was the smart woman's magazine. It was about, um, it was about fashion, but it was about um, poetry and literature and publishing great authors and great photography. It just covered everything. And the staff at Mademoiselle when I was there was, they were, they were legendary. The women were extraordinary. They all went on to run other big businesses and companies and magazines from there. Uh, it was great, but they had this contest called Guest Editorship, which, Guest Editors, which back then these guest editors were almost like a focus group for the industry. Uh, was, nobody had computers and phones or any of that kind of technology. Um, so I joined the college board when I was in college. I sent in an application, which you'd find in the magazine, to be a Mademoiselle um, college board member. And that meant I got mail from them frequently. And you'd fill out questionnaires about um, this product or that product or what you were thinking about. And it was a way of them to really get in the heads of the college audience of theirs. Um, and if you wanted to move further up in this competition, you could submit a project. Um, and they gave you certain ideas, but you had to do something either in the, the main disciplines of the magazine, in fashion and photography and art and design. I was studying graphic design and uh, communication design at the University of Buffalo, at SUNY Buffalo. And I submitted a designed like a direct mail piece to be an, uh, to solicit subscriptions to Mademoiselle. 
so it was something that folded out many different ways and it was very colorful and and next thing I knew is I got a call from somebody at, at the magazine at school um, that said, uh, must have been a letter, because I don't even know how I would have gotten a call, um, that there was going to be an editor visiting in the area, would I be available to show them around? And I, of course, did that and spent a day with an editor from Mademoiselle. Little did I know I was being interviewed as a finalist for the competition. And the competition would pick 20 students from around the country, and you would come for the month of June to live in New York at the Barbizon Hotel for Women, which is now, you know, residences and Equinox gym. Um, and you would be wined and dined, literally, um, by every advertiser, by all the uh, fashion houses. You'd go interview different people. There was always a trip involved, so it was always travel with the travel editor. Uh, our year it went to Israel, in fact. And you helped put together what was the, the August issue. It was really the going back to college, school issue, which it was a time when people bought clothing to go back to college. Every, school, every department store had a department filled with clothing to go back to school. Now, you know, it's buying another hoodie and another pair of jeans to go back to school. Um, so that was a really big deal. I mean, and uh, Sylvia Plath is one of the more famous um, you know, um, guest editors and Betsy Johnson and uh, Bonnie August and um, Ali McGraw and all sorts of extraordinary uh, people. Um, lots of writers and um, it's, it's a fa fascinating group of, group of women. And I, it was an extraordinary experience for a month. I mean, for me, coming back to New York wasn't the big deal, but I was living in the Barbizon with these 19 other women. Uh, many of them had never been to New York before, you know, and there were parties and George Barkington was a big fashion photographer for the magazine, had big studio, you know, had parties and, you know, you're meeting all sorts of fabulous people. Um, if that existed today, it would be a reality TV show, you know, and you'd have 20 students, 20 young women, and now then they added men at the end. Um, you know, competing for the job or competing for the boyfriend, you know, living in some high glossy apartment in the, you know, Upper East Side or something, you know, and it would, would just be some really bitchy TV show. But it was an incredible uh, thing to be a, a Mademoiselle GE, as we were known, a guest editor. I was the guest art editor. And I then, when that month was over, I did my typical college thing that everybody did when they graduated. Went to Europe for the summer with a friend with a Eurail pass. And when I came back, my mom said that Mademoiselle had been calling to offer me a job. So I was the only one of my group that was actually offered a full-time job after that at the magazine, which I took. Yes, so you have interesting uh, interests and talents because evidently you were interested in art and had some talent in art and also uh, you can write and you're, you, you, you know about business. So after, so you had a number of interesting jobs before you went to the CFDA. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk about sure. them? Sure. Well, you know, and the artistic whole side of things was interesting though because my, my dad paints. He was a painter and my mo mother painted as well. And uh, he was, he used to do books of poetry. He'd write a poem for everybody in the family and when kids were born. And, you know, so there were all these very nice, sensitive things about him. You know, I always say today he was probably would have been gay if we knew better. Um, but he was, he was very, very good about all that artistic stuff. And they, my parents would buy us art supplies all the time. Went to, went to art school at the Brooklyn Museum growing up. You know, because they went to the theater all the time. My mother loved Broadway. And so every time they came home, they brought us art supplies to, to do something with. Um, and took us to the theater. Whenever she saw a play that she thought we would like, she immediately bought more tickets and went back again. So that was very much part of our upbringing, you know, being aware of all of, all of those disciplines um, uh, with me and my sisters. And, um, but when I left, when I joined Mademoiselle, which was my first job out of college in 19, um, end of 1969, um, I was in the college competitions department, so that meant I was now 
working on the next group of guest editors and going to campuses. And I was traveling to every college in America, you know, at like 23 years old, where I was too young to even rent a car, and I had to rent cars in these airports and cities to drive to these campuses. And it was a very heady time to be doing that because it was the Vietnam War. There were protests everywhere about the world coming to an end, you know, and, and everybody being so angry and militant. Even at Buffalo, where I went to school, was very, very active. It was the Berkeley of the East. Um, so it was a tough time to then be on a campus talking about a fashion magazine, so to speak. But we managed to do that and get the next few years of guest editors on board. And I then moved into merchandising at the magazine, so it meant I went to every department store in the country doing in-store events. And that was a terrific experience because uh, every city had its, you know, its, its department store. It had its, its signature store, Marshall Fields, Higby's, uh, Meyer and Grace, I mean, all these different stores, which now are Macy's, you know, they, it's all been homogenized. There's very few of those local stores anymore. Uh, but that was a, a marvelous, marvelous experience. And then I left the magazine and I had a short job on 7th Avenue, working in 1412 Broadway for a showroom, um, a, a company called Cinnamon Wear which was a great company making interesting madras clothes from India that was really timeless. They had a boutique in Bendel's, Henry Bendel at the time. And then um, I was fired from that job I, around Christmas time. And I, that was a lesson I learned that I would never, ever do that if I was in charge to fire somebody at the holidays. Um, and, and then, I forget how it all worked out, but I, the sequence, but I was the fashion director at Gimbel's East, which is another place that doesn't exist now. Mademoiselle doesn't exist. Gimbel's East doesn't exist, uh, which was on 86th Street and Lexington Avenue. And it was the flagship, you know, designer store for Gimbel's, which was a big promotional store down on Broadway opposite Macy's. And I loved that job because it was designing windows with some of the best people in the industry, hiring fabulous graphic designers and, and fashion illustrators that I knew from um, George Stavrinos, who did unbelievable work, um, and um, oh my gosh, several other fabulous names that'll, that'll come to me. Um, I gave a lot of people their first breaks doing stuff for me, and I was shopping the market with the buyers. We had our own buyers for that store because it was really dedicated to the Upper East Side. Um, did in-store events, did, you know, all sorts of promotional stuff, did our own ads in the New York Times. Um, it, it was a mar that was really, I learned so much in that job until Mace, until Gimbel's was bought and um, it was Gimbel's Sachs bought, owned Gimbel's and they said, go down to the fashion office on 33rd Street. And I said, really? There's a fashion office down there? Um, you know, it was organizing the clothing in the stores, like, okay, all the whites together, then the yellows, then the, I said, uh, I think I'm time to leave. And I also then, you know, also had a lot of friends who are architects and interior designers. My sister was an interior designer uh, and, and working in architectural firms for I and Pay and Skidmore Owings and Merrill. And so I got very involved in events called Designer Saturday, which was all the showrooms that were open for the interiors world. All my friends wound up in that universe. And everybody was asking me for favors all the time. How do you get this done? How do you get that done? Where do I get, buy balloons? Where do I get invitations printed? And I said, do I have 411 printed on my forehead? You know, now nobody even knows what 411 is. You know, you just Google everything. Um, but I thought, you know, I, I realized I can get paid for that information. So I opened up a public relations company and I wound up doing that in my friends' offices who are architects and interior designers, Bromley Jacobson, uh, my friend Scott Bromley, who's still my best friend to this day, and Robin Jacobson, who unfortunately died of AIDS. And they had an office on 59th Street, and first, uh, first, between first and second. And at the time, they were designing Studio 54. So that was a very fun time to be in that office with Steve and Ian coming up for meetings and, you know, watching all of that happen. 
Um, it was a remarkable time. And I started by helping them and help representing them. And I knew a lot of people. It was how do you get this published? How do you get that published? And it was just, to me, public relations was common sense. And so, you know, we wound up getting a lot of clients in the interior furnishings industry. <clears throat> One of my first assistants was a young girl named Jane Hertzmark, who shared a typewriter return on my desk. That was, we had a little corner and she shared the return. We'd eat pea soup every day over our typewriters. Um, and she worked for me for six years. We eventually moved to another office. But uh, Jane, when she left me, went to back to school to get a master's in, at Columbia. And she's now um, group global president of almost half the brands at Estee Lauder. I mean, probably the most successful woman in the cosmetic business, Jane of Huddis. And, you know, we're still best friends. She actually woke me up this morning to tell me something at like seven something where she's already at her desk. Um, and, you know, it's just been fascinating. The people who worked for me through, the, through all of that, uh, that office like I said, started working with interiors and architecture. And also one of our first clients was Selma Weiser, who had a store on the west side called Sharaveri that the old timers all know. Uh, she brought all the Japanese designers to America and even I think Armani for the first time to America. Uh, but she had a small store on the west side on Broadway and wanted to get people in after work to, you know, have, you know, wine and see what they're doing. And, Mark Jacobs was a stock boy in that store at the time. So it's real good fashion history there. Um, but that my business grew and we had more and more interiors companies and, um, and working for all the textile firms, architectural firms, doing big openings, store openings, product launches, new chairs were launched at the trade shows in California and at Neocon in Chicago and at the different, uh, different markets. And then um, one client I had was the International Design Center in New York, the IDCNY, which was building a huge design center in Long Island City. Um, and we took that on working with I.M. Pei as the master planner and Guafami Siegel with the architects and Joe Durso and Massimo and Leila Vignelli were doing all the graphics and communication. And they became real mentors of mine in my life. And I it was beautiful working with all these designers and all these creative people putting this several million square foot project together. Um, but then the recession hit at uh, the end of the 80s and it was, they were letting everybody go, cutting back on everything. And I hate when companies fire the creative people first, you know, fire the business people first because they're not doing it. The creative people are keeping the place alive. So in any case, I left and I took a freelance PR job um, with Harriet Weintraub in the industry with my triple roll Rolodex and worked in an office with um, Leslie Stevens, who went on to open up her own big um, LaForce Stevens PR firm years later. And I worked on an event for Cooper Hewitt Museum with Pantone, doing a color day, doing all sorts of wonderful projects. And I kept reading about the CFDA in Women's Wear Daily, you know, about how they were looking for a new director. And uh, it was an interesting, I, I was reading Women's Wear Daily since, uh, since high school. My father would bring it home from work every day. So I always read the paper, I always knew what was going on in the business. Uh, but in, it was also at the time of the big AIDS crisis happening in, in the world and in our industry a lot. So I was a founding board member of DIFA, the Design Industries Foundation Fighting AIDS. And we did a lot of fantastic projects. I personally did a project called Edible Architecture, which was at Sotheby's and got all the architects and interior designers to design an object, a building or some furniture related something. Um, and to give me the drawings of the things that they did. And then I had them all executed in three dimension. So this was before there were cake shows on TV and cupcake shows and how to bake everything. I found all the specialty bakers and model makers who make these things, um, food stylists. You know, so we had a big white building that was beautiful that Richard Meyer had done the drawing of. And we had it all executed in chiclets so it looked like white tiles. 
Um, you know, and we had another gal, Judith Stockman, did a beautiful chandelier. We had it made all out of gumdrops and candies. Um, Gaetano Pesce, the Italian architect, did a bed covered in, you know, um, like a fluffy bed with pist with pistachio nuts and strawberries, and it was all done in that. Um, what's the wonderful cake frosting that's just like molded? It was just beautiful. Uh, Milton Glaser did a big pear building that was executed. The the things were brilliant. We raised over half a million dollars. It was a lot of money. Sold everything at Sotheby's. Um, all the objects was done in big plastic, you know, plexi boxes so you can keep the things. And the drawings were all framed by every framer in New York for free. Um, it was a wonderful project. But we were doing really wonderful things for DIFFA at the time because somebody had to do something to raise money and raise, raise awareness. Nothing was happening. And we went to the CFDA to talk to them. It was a, the fashion organization. It was a small organization to see about doing something together with, with them for fashion. And they, they, they didn't want to do it. They said they were going to do something on their own. Um, so eventually they did an event called Seventh on Sale, which was in the fall of 1990, I think, in November. And it was a four-day sale at the Armory on 26th Street. The place was transformed into this gala dinner that Anna Winter organized. And you know, it was Donna Calvin Ralph with chairs. And every designer had a booth that was beautifully hung, draped muslin that Robert Isabel designed. And people bought tickets to go and buy clothing wholesale or below from the designers who were each in their booths hawking their stuff. You'd get a ticket for two hours to shop and you know the announcements when you had to get online to check out. The checkout lines were enormous. There were lines around the block for three days to get into the place to go shopping. And so when that was over, the CFDA had raised, cleared and raised about $5 million for the New York City AIDS Fund. But the office was depleted. There was nobody left. Carolyn Rome was the president. And she resigned. Um, there was a young man named Robert Isabel was the director, who was a friend of Perry Ellis's. His contract was not renewed, so there was an office not much bigger than the area I'm sitting in, you know, and everybody said they thought the CFDA was an answering machine. You know, people would just leave messages on the phone. Um, and so I read that after this, I went to the event. I went to the dessert ticket because I, I couldn't afford a dinner ticket. And the firm I was with, Harriet Weintraub, at Loving and Weintraub, they were doing the PR for it. Um, and so after that event, when I was reading about them looking for somebody to hire uh, to take it, take on the CFDA, I said, maybe I should go up for this. And everybody was like, oh my god, so what a great idea. And so that started the next journey in my life. You know, okay, who do I call? They said, call Donna Karen. I said, Donna Karen's not going to take my call. Why should, you know, she's not going to pick up the phone from me. And then they said, send an email to Stan Herman. Uh, well, not even an email. I didn't, we didn't have email. Send a resume to Stan Herman and Monica Tilly with a search committee. <clears throat> so I prepared a resume, got that off to them. And I got a call literally the minute they received it. When can you, how soon can you come in? And I came in and met with Stan and Monica. And Stan, I said to Stan, you know, I met you a long time ago. And he said, when? And I said, I was a Mademoiselle guest editor in 1969. And you, my team was the fashion team in the group. Four or five of us went to interview you at Mr. Morton. And he goes, oh my god, I remember that. I said, no, you don't. I know you're lying, but that's OK. Um, and you know, it's, it fascinates me how these connections resurface in your life and come back. Um, and then they asked me to come to the next interview, another interview. They had already actually picked their five finalists after seeing hundreds of resumes and meeting like 30 people, I think. Um, and I joined the five finalists. I was the sixth now for a meeting with Calvin Klein, Bill Blass, Carolyn Rome, and Stan. And uh, I, that meeting was scary. Um, but, you know, they, I knew Calvin from Fire Island and parties and things. And, Bill Blass looked like my dad, so I was like a little okay with that. And 
they said, why should we hire you? You know, you haven't been in fashion in 10 years. And I said, well, I never stopped wearing clothing. And they all, you know, laughed. And I said, I never stopped shopping. I never stopped going to, you know, looking at magazines. You know, I said, the fashion in me is in my DNA. It's, it's not about a job. You know, you either have it or you don't. And next thing I knew, I was, you know, the finalist and asked to come to the, a board meeting to be ratified by the entire board. And that was, uh, that was quite frightening. It was Oscar and Bill and Ralph and Donna and Calvin and uh, Casper and Marianne Restivo and Patricia Underwood and everybody who was on the board at the time, Mary McFadden. Um, even Eleanor Lampert was there who helped found the organization. She hated me. Um, and, you know, they, they queried me a lot. And there was a lot of back and forth about, you know, how could you be raising money for DIFA if you're going to work for us? And I said, don't ask me to not raise money for my friends who are dying. You know, I'll never not do that. But I'll never not give you, you know, a thousand percent of my time. And then some. And there was a lot of interesting stuff back and forth. And then I was sent out of the room while they deliberated. And I came back in and the entire board of CFDA sang happy birthday to me. It was my birthday that day. And I was hired. Yeah. Your impact on the fashion business is probably equal to hers in, in a certain way. And did, w because you're somebody who has thought about it in big ways and in innovative ways and has helped to make it what it is. And did you articulate some of this at, at the interview or, or were you just so so energetic and competent that they figured you could help Well, them. you know, I had been so involved in fundraising at that point because of my DIFA work and creating all these events for them. Um, a warehouse sale that really was a forerunner to the seventh on sale event. Um, I, you know, I, I said, you know, I organized an industry of architects and interior designers and got them all together to focus on things. and. You know, I could probably do that for the fashion designers. And, um, you know, I didn't articulate so much about what could happen, but um, I think they saw my inherent love and respect uh, for the industry. And it is a respect. I mean, I really admire the creative talent and what they go through, you know, because I think, I think a lot of people don't give fashion designers enough credit for what they do. You know, I think, um, you know, I've always said even when I, was at CFDA. You know, a writer could write a book, a great American novel, and, you know, and get great accolades for it, and then can take a year off and travel or do nothing, and a painter can work furiously, do a show, and exhibit, exhibit, sell everything, and then take their time painting again until they feel it. And actors and actresses read scripts, they do movies, they're very busy, then it's like, leave me alone for a few years. I'm, you know, taken off. I said, fashion designers can't say, you know, I'm skipping spring. I just don't feel it. You know, I, I, don't have, I don't have any ideas for fall, so let's come back to me next season. You know, they can't do that. They have to keep turning out the goods over and over and over and over again. You know, and I always respected that, that discipline that they had, and, you know, and, and the fact that they're always criticized of everything. You know, they always judge and jury. Everybody's a critic on everything that they do. Um, whether it's their advertising, their marketing, their showroom, their, their fashion shows, their, you know, and then yet they have to sell it to the buyers, they have to sell it to the consumers, they have to sell it to the media. You know, it's, it's constant and it's not two collections a year. Now it's, you know, four, five, six and licensed collections, God knows, it's, it's a crazy business. Um, so, I mean, all of that came across, but you know, Fashion Week was not anything that we thought about, you know, um, that is the next story, you know, how that all happened. Yeah, so do you want to <coughs> have a sip of water and then tell us about how that happened? As I said, I was hired um, after that big meeting, which was the end of March, March 26th. 
Um, and, and I said I wouldn't start for a couple of weeks to settle all sorts of things that I was doing and finishing up. Um, you know, and they had taken me to see the office, which I thought, oh my God, this is the headquarters for the American fashion industry. You've got to be kidding. You know, and um, so I was, you know, thinking about all of those things, how to get everything organized. And during that time was Fashion Week or Market Week when the shows would happen. And at that time, if there were 50 shows, they were in 50 locations. I mean, nobody, no two people ever did a show in the same location. Um, whether it was downtown, uptown, midtown, nobody really cared who was doing it somewhere else. I mean, yes, Ruth Finley did a calendar, but you know, she couldn't tell you where to do anything or what to do. She, it was just the date and time. And you know, at that time, she was much better at, no, you can't do it at one o'clock. Bill Blass is at one o'clock. You know, now, you know, 12 people could do a show at one o'clock. No, they don't care who else is showing. Um, and so there was a f market week and I was watching that from the sidelines and Michael Kors had a show in an empty loft space down in the 20s in Chelsea. Uh, it was in, in a building that I think he had a showroom in, but it was an empty raw concrete space. And, you know, when you put the bass music on in a fashion show, nice and loud, and it, excuse me, anything that's not nailed down shakes and moves. Well, when they turned the music on, the ceiling shook and moved, and literally chunks of plaster started falling down right onto the runway, um, on the shoulders of Naomi, Cindy, Linda, Claudia, all the one-name supermodels that Michael has always worked with. You know, they kind of just brushed it off their shoulders and kept walking. But chunks of plaster landed in the laps and in the handbags in the front row of Susie Menkes from the International Herald Tribune and Carrie Donovan, who was the fashion critic for the New York Times. And the next day they wrote, the headlines were, we live for fashion, we don't want to die for it. And people were really, nobody remembered what was in that show. Everybody was looking for emergency exits if God forbid more of the ceiling came down. And it was, it was the shot heard from Sarajevo and I saw all that and I said, I think my job description just changed. And while it literally was never a conversation in all the interviews about organizing fashion shows, um, that became an immediate priority. And I started looking at every empty parking lot, every empty garage, every space, every pier, like where could we organize something big enough to accommodate this? And it was, you know, we started having meetings and setting up, I set up committees with young designers, some established designers to discuss this and talk about it, getting the PR people and production people involved because they all were afraid that if you got something organized, they would lose their, their you know, grip on it. And, you know, if they don't rent chairs every hour on the hour, they're going to lose money, you know, because they make a, a fee on everything. So there were a lot of different constituencies that had to be neutralized to make this happen. Um, and that was, you know, 91 when this started. Nin in 92, in the summer, um, was the Democratic Convention in New York. And that was the convention that nominated Bill Clinton to be the candidate for the party to run for president. And so that year I spent on a committee with everybody else in New York from the theater wings, from the um, museums, from the hospitals, from the hotel groups. You know, it was a, it was a, a year of meetings for like New York City, it wasn't quite called the Convention Bureau, but it was a host committee. What could we do in the summer when the delegates are in town? You know, how do we put New York best foot forward? You know, all the museums opened for that's when the Museum Miles started, pro project started, and the food hospitality restaurant thing started. Um, we said we'd put on a fashion show, obviously. And so we worked with Kevin Cryer, who recently passed away. Um, to put on a show and we got permission to do it in Central Park only because of the gravitas of the convention because they don't let you do that otherwise um, and we got a tent put up in the sheep meadow and it accommodated about 1200 people in the tent all open viewing you know you could see from everywhere we got every designer to participate everybody had like two looks and it was really a spectacular show. At the end of the show, each designer walked down the runway with their models. 
and it was it was Calvin and Ralph and Donna and it was Oscar and it was Bill and it was Nicole Miller and Isaac Mizrahi and Todd Oldham and Anna Swee and Diane von Furstenberg and um, you know Tommy I mean you name it everybody was in it and at the end of the show when they all walked off the runway at the end onto the lawn they all looked at me and said is this what you're talking about a tent like this because we'd been having meetings and meetings and meetings to figure this out and I said, yes, a tent like this. Um, and, you know, it was the first time they really visualized it because as creative as they were, they couldn't quite transform what they were doing because many of those people were doing shows in their showrooms, which were tiny, you know, 557th Avenue, 530. They'd clear out racks of clothes and it was fire traps. If the fire department ever knew any of these shows were going on, you know, it was like a rave. They moved from one place to another they would have shut them down in a minute. There were no exits. Um, people would have been, it was horrifying. I mean, there were freight elevators that were stuck. I remember we had to once carry, Liz Tilberis had to get carried out of the freight elevator at 550 that was stuck between middle floors. Um, there were lights crashing in some of the spaces. They were terrible things. Isaac had a show in a loft space down on Broadway. And if you had a ticket to an Isaac Mizrahi show, you didn't leave your seat. It was nighttime, and it was some third or fourth floor space. And everybody had, um, I think they had face masks, you know, like fans with Isaac's face on it. And everybody's sitting in their seats, and the lights blew. I mean, pitch black, literally pitch black. And no, there was no lighting designer to be found. He'd already left to go to the next show. Uh, they had to wait till backup generators came. People were smoking, so they had lighters and photographers put their flashes on and everybody waited till the, the backup generators came and the show went on. But these were horrifying, scary, you know, things happening. So now this industry was aware the tent really solidified that. Um, and that was in the summer, that fall, they, um, they okayed a trip for me to go to Europe and I went to the shows in Paris and Milan to see what they were doing and come back and report. And Paris was doing tents in the courtyard of the Louvre. Milan was in the, um, so in the fairgrounds where the fairs all happened in the big buildings. And you know, I met with a lot of people over there, came back with tons of R&D and sat down one-on-one -on -one with all the key pe people and said, we've got to do this, we've got to do this. Hired somebody to work literally in the closet in our office, which I had now already moved to a higher floor and my friends, Scott Bromley, the architects I work with, helped design a new office for CFDA. Um, and that was an interim one, because then we then moved again to a bigger space. And, um, and it was all in 1412 Broadway, where I, the building I was fired from. So it was that full circle to come back triumphantly into that building again. And it was... Um, you know, it was fascinating trying to get everybody to agree to do this. You know, we'd be at meetings at the 500 Club, which was one of those clubs in the building on 7th Avenue. And I remember one where the room was filled, and it was like a lot of the production PR and designers established and young. And it was always the young designers who were like afraid they were going to lose their identity. You know, well, is Calvin Klein going to show in the tents? And I said, um, well, let's hear from Calvin. So Calvin was sitting right in the front row. I said, do you want to come up? And Calvin Klein came up to the podium and he said, I absolutely am going to show. He said, this is something which we all have to do together to make this work. You know, this is not about my show only. It's about the American industry putting our best foot forward. And for the first few, you know, that shut the room up pretty quickly when Calvin got up and spoke. Um, but then the next challenge was raising the money to get these tents built. And the fashion industry, while it makes a lot of money, doesn't like to spend a lot of money. So the designers, you know, their biggest cost was models and, you know, and it, and it costs a lot to put on a show. So how are we going to pay for this? So we said, let's get some corporate sponsors who have a reason to want the in industry to succeed. And that was a fun time um, calling literally dialing for dollars every day in my office. And the first person that we got money from was Evian. 
and that was through a friend of mine who was a publisher at um, Harper's Bazaar, and she said she had met with um, this man, Mark Rodriguez from Evian, and that they were doing a lot of new things now, and this is when there was Evian and Perrier in the stores, not 89 different waters, and they were looking to rebrand in a way in America, and so she put him in touch with me. He loved the idea. And he said, how much do you need? And I, I had no idea, honestly. I mean, we had no budgets figured out on any of this. I said $100,000. And he said, fine, we'll do it for a year. Um, and Anna Winter was probably the next call. And explaining to Anna what we were doing and what we wanted to do. And didn't quite have drawings and plans yet to show her. It was just, we need to do this. And she said, how much do you need? And I think at that time I said $500,000. And she said, well, let me, let me get back to you. And she said, let me speak to Cy. And she spoke to Cy Newhouse. She called back probably the same day because she's very quick. And she said, we'll give you $100,000. And I said, great, we'll take it. Um, and I think that's probably where the 100 came from. I probably hadn't given Mark the amount yet. And then I called up the president of Hearst. And I said, Vogue is giving us $100,000. And he said, oh, OK, then Bizarro will have to give you $100,000. And then I called up the president of Hachette Filipaki, who is, of all people, the famous David Pecker now, who figures in all the Trump stories from AMI. And he said, well, I will give you 100. And then um, Hearst people called back and said, can we also add town and country for another 100? I said, sure can. You know, and I called friends who I knew at Clairol, and I said, you know, this is about American product and industry. You know, do you want to be the hair sponsor? And and they bought into it. Jane, who used to be my assistant, was now heading up prescriptives at Lauder, and I said, it's a perfect brand. You know, let's have prescriptives be involved. And she got a hundred grand for the company to be the first beauty sponsor. And she was at that time training Aaron Lauder, the business. So Aaron was working on site to help execute everything. And then I called the president of General Motors. I mean, you have to really be fearless. And I mean, I wish I was that fearless now and a little stupid, you know, because it's much easier. And I said, you know, this is what we're doing. And they put me through to the president's office. And I spoke to his assistant, and she said, can you send us some information? And I'll get it to you know, my boss. And, I said, and we did. We had packages by then. And, and then he called back. When we called back, we spoke to him, and they were very interested. And David Pecker said, uh, I publish all the car, car and driver and motor magazines um, at Hachette. I'll get you that, because they owe us favors and stuff. And David closed the deal for General Motors for us. And I called the New York Times, who gave us uh, money and support right from the get-go, and was always on board. Um, and I mean, I got Moet and Chandon to do champagne. And, and you know, we were off and running. And that's how it started. We were the first fashion week that had sponsors, I think, anywhere in the world, you know, and broke that open to a whole new category for everybody worldwide. Yeah, that's an American. Uh, idea, the yeah. idea of this private public yeah. partnerships, you know. Uh, and, yeah. Uh, yeah, and the first two seasons that we did the shows before we got all these real sponsors involved were at the Macklow Hotel, which is now the Millennial. And that's Harry Macklow had that hotel and he had knocked it down the buildings next door in the middle of the night and was a persona non grata in the real estate community. Um, but he saw that we were always looking for space because it was always in women's wear. And so we did two seasons at the hotel in funny spaces, making it work, just to see if we can get people together. And then all this money was raised to do Bryant Park, you know, and that's when we launched. And, and I hired the Michael Beirut, who was the guy working with the Vignellis for all those years to do the graphics and do a 7th on 6th logo. You know, we named it 7th on 6th because we were moving 7th Avenue to 6th Avenue. Um, and it was like named after 7th on Sale, and which was the big AIDS benefit that we'd done. And, and what about the rest is history. Did you have allies within the administration? Or? Funny you should ask that. Because um, I actually just told that story to somebody the other night at um, 
right here at FIT at Carl McCall's retirement party um, because my friends, the Zagats from the Zagat Guide said, oh, David Dinkins is here. You want to come say hi? I said, no, I'm not a big fan. And he goes, why not? And I said, well, I'll tell you. And this is what happened. When we were planning this, I said, we need the city. We made um, appointments to meet with Dinkins and get the mayor's support. And so we finally got a breakfast meeting up at Gracie Mansion. Um, we got up there, you know, whatever early time and waited quite a while for him. He came in in his tennis whites because he was playing tennis in the morning and sat down with his various commissioners and, you know, we told him what we wanted to do. And, and he, I said, we need support from the city and some help. And uh, this is such an important part of New York, the fashion industry and the Seventh Avenue. Oh, if I help you guys, I have to help this group, and I have to do this, and then we have to help this one. I mean, he just he could could have been less couldn't be more less interested. And I said, but you know, if we are successful, the fashion industry will pay the pays the taxes that pay for all those programs that you're talking about. There'll be more money for schools and for roads and for transportation because this industry generates billions of dollars in, in New York. And, oh, no, no, no. And he just was kind of testy about it all. And I, so I, I can't even believe I said it, but I said, I guess we'll just have to take up that offer in New Jersey at the Meadowlands. And he looked at me, he goes, what? You're threatening to move to New Jersey? And I said, well, it seems like the only way anybody gets your attention in New York. And, and it was true, because, I mean, any business that said, we're going to move our headquarters to New Jersey, oh, tax break immediately. You know, they've made deals left and right. So people looked at me like, I can't believe you said that to him. And, you know, the city was then helpful in permitting and things that it would do anyway. You know, banners on the poles and who to do work with on that. And, and, you know, we had to close streets a lot to put all the trucks on the side and get everything loaded into the park. You know, the big negotiation was negotiating with Bryant Park to get this to happen. Um, that wasn't easy, but the park was at that time going under its renovation. It was Needle Park in the works to become this new park. And the restaurant wasn't there. You know, we weren't on the lawn at the beginning. We were on the plaza with the fountain halfway sitting, jutting into the tent. And we had, we called the tents our three muses. It was Celeste, Gertrude, and um, Elizabeth, Josephine. So it was the Josephine Shore Lowell Fountain. Um, Gertrude was, because of the Gertrude Stein statue in the park, sat prominently backstage at the big tent. And designers at every show would throw necklaces and beads and hats on her. And then Celeste was Celeste Bardo's forum we used in the library. And then we had marquee tents connecting everything. So you walked down there, you walked this one, you know, and the two tents were parallel to 6th Avenue. Um, you know, one right behind the library and one you know, where the stairs are, but it went long ways. And it was, it was crazy, but, um, you know, when we did a ribbon cutting the first season, it was uh, Joyce um, Dinkins, the mayor's wife, came and did it. The mayor didn't come. And I don't even know if he ever came to a show, really. I mean, he got his tennis stadium, and that's what he wanted, in Forest Hills. And, um, but we got our fashion week and got it off and running and, you know, and existed there in that configuration for several years um, and succeeded beyond my wildest imagination, you know, until we, we were constantly bickering with Dan Biederman at Bryant Park about, you got to move this three inches this way, you got to, this is hitting the tulip bed, this is, damaging this limestone. You know, we used to take pictures of every stone in the park before we'd come in and then pictures after so that they couldn't blame us for putting a crack in a stone. You know, we'd re the lawns all the time. And um, I mean, it was, you can't even imagine what it was like working in Bryant Park and with an administration there that really didn't want us there. And so one season, so we, well, we were forced out and we moved to Chelsea Piers one season. And I thought we had great shows at Chelsea Piers. You know, beautiful, unobstructed spaces because they're photo studios, so they were, you know, column free and, um, you know, the beautiful one, you're on the waterfront. Um, but 
and when we worked with Charlie Gargano, who was the state, um, um, I forget his title, but we moved barricades on the West Side Highway so that you didn't have to go into that whole, at that time, this whole circular entry that took time to get into Chelsea Piers. You could just pull in off there. We had General Motors cars lined up all the time to take people come to and from. Uh, you know, I mean, they really worked with us. They were, they were great. But the press, everybody hated it. They said, we don't want to be looking at New Jersey. You know, and I said, hey, stupid, you're supposed to be looking at the clothes. You know, like, how beautiful. We're on the waterfront, and there's a great restaurant here, and, you know, and you could uh, enjoy this. They said, well, we don't want to be crossing a highway in our stilettos. I said, you, you know, it's not like the LA freeways. It's, there's this traffic light, and the lights change, and you cross the street. I said, wear more comfortable shoes then. You know, it was just crazy. Um, but at that point, um, Giuliani was mayor, and Bud Kohnheim, who recently passed away from Nicole Miller, was very good friends with Giuliani. And he wrote, uh, he got us back in the mayor's good graces and said, give them back, get them back in Bryant Park. And that's when everything changed and they let us use the lawn. And so we had to build up to cover, protect the lawn because the stacks for all the library is underneath the lawn. And um, we had to have traps to get out. God forbid something happened, you could come through the floor. And um, it was pretty wild, but that changed the configuration where you then saw the tents and the facade of the tent from 6th Avenue and you went up the stairs and you went in and the fountain now was a centerpiece in the lobby. And then the village was behind it, you know, all the different venues. And that, that was the model that really worked for so many years. Yes, and then um, you then uh, moved to IMG where you continued. Uh, well, we were working with IMG to help us at a certain point when we hit a brick wall to sell sponsorships because they were really good at that. And we realized, uh, you know, we, I was running CFDA and 7th on 6th, uh, working with Stan Herman, who was president, but I was doing all the fundamental work. And, you know, we were trying to raise money and robbing Peter to pay Paul and keeping everything afloat. You know, sponsors would come in and change and go in and out. I mean, we'd lost General Motors after a while and Mercedes was flirting with us. And, um, and IMG came to, we owed IMG, we actually owed IMG commissions on the sponsorships that they had sold for us. And they said to us, we'll eliminate the commission. Um, why don't you let us buy 7th on 6th? And we said, how could you buy this? It's a not-for-profit. And we did all the legal work with our lawyers. And there were two separate you know, not-for-profit trade associations. And we did. We, we sold it to IMG because they, um, they were an event company who had legs and could amortize costs of things and get us better deals on a lot of these things. And so it was an interesting time. We, it was after 10 years of the tents at, under CFDA's um, banner. And then we sold it to IMG. And that's when, and actually the first season that IMG had the shows was September 11th, well, the September 11th, when the, the World Trade Center you know, came tumbling down. That was a whole uh, horrifying day and weeks in everybody's lives, but having to shut down Fashion Week and go into the backstages and tell people, stop what you're doing, we've just been attacked by terrorists, please grab your things and go home. You know, that was, I mean, I, I still shudder. I, I, I'll start crying when I talk about it. But, but in any case, IMG then, to am leverage the cost of a team working just on this one event said we need to create more of this to, you know, make it all work. And that's when we started doing um, LA uh, Fashion Week and working with the Standard Hotel downtown. And then we created the Miami Swim Shows at the Raleigh in Miami, which working with the Visitor and Convention Bureau in Miami was looking for something in the summer to bring more business and traffic to Miami. And that show is still one of my favorite shows that we did. You know, all the, all the sponsor lounges were in cabanas by the pool, you know. 
was in Miami, we had a, a beautiful clear tent on the sand and we'd lined up the chaise lounges, you know, to be just long rows. And so people were sitting on chaises instead of seats with feet in the sand. And, you know, and the models walked, I mean, they were in bathing suits and resort so, so they walked in the sand and we had tents on the street on the side of the hotel. Uh, it was so much fun. I mean, you know, we'd be in the pool having meetings all day and with margaritas and start the shows at six o'clock when, you know, it got a little cooler out and, you know, and some people would do a plexi runway across the pool and uh, and then we start, we started with the international um, expansion with Mumbai and in India was Lakme Fashion Week which I worked on for 10 years and I'm still friends and pals with everybody in India um, and then we created the Berlin Fashion Week working with Mercedes and uh, we bought one of the fashion weeks in Moscow and we bought the um, Australian uh, fashion industry um, shows that they were doing in Sydney and Melbourne and took those over and and then started working with folks in Toronto and consulting in Mexico City and um, just everywhere. And I was getting, you know, we were getting calls, could you come to Dubai and talk to us about doing this, you know, do something in Singapore and what about in Japan? And And so I became like the global ambassador talking about fashion weeks and you know, what we could do with them and IMG. At that point, I mean, I would say that all these fashion weeks were like little pearls and IMG was the necklace stringing them together. Um, you know, and now that IMG is still involved in many of them in sponsorship or production, some in ownership, um, you know, and uh, it was an interesting time. You know, I've had a great experience doing all that, that traveling. Yeah, I think, What's fascinating about all of this is that this helped to, cons to institutionalize and consolidate uh, the world fashion businesses in mm -hmm. a sense. Yeah. At, and uh, at the same time in the United States, there's also other huge changes happening with the uh, moving of manufacturing out, out of the United States. Oh, it's, it's horrible what's happened with all of that. Yes, and the, uh, the decline of department stores and the rise of internet buying. So that was happening in the, in the, at the same time, but on the other hand, uh, you were part of this of fashion institutionalization, and the, the 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 fashion becomes part of popular culture. Oh, totally. And becomes part of everyone's. Um, fashion became it became the new event in town. It, it it got more publicity than the U.S. Open, I think. You know, it, it generated so much media. It was at the cusp of when cable TV and 24-hour news was happening and all of these stations and style channels and um, metro channels and fashion channels were happening. People were just gaga. They couldn't get enough fashion coverage. And they'd, you know, they'd do the runways and then there'd be a week of stories about, let's just do the hair. You know, let's just talk about what the colors were. Let's just talk about you know, the accessories. Let's, you know, it became content that got chopped up and used like crazy. And, you know, when we started the shows, I mean, I remember people would wait outside the tents uh, for the photographers to come out and they would collect all their film, you know, buckets of film and take them to the labs to produce, to um, print out the contact sheets and what have you. They'd come back, you'd see all these photographers sitting in the floor in the lobbies and in the park benches, circling things with their loop and picking pictures out. You know, at the end of a runway show, the runway, the photographers' um, platforms were covered in those plastic canisters that the film came in, thousands of them. I mean, now you don't see a one. Everybody's digital. You know, people were afraid to let digital cameras in the shows because, oh, everybody's going to be knocked off in Hong Kong now. You know, that's what they were afraid about, that people are going to send pictures there and tomorrow the clothing is being made. Well, you know, that happens, but that's really not what happened. But it changed everything. You know, the digital technology 
now, I mean, I, I, I mean, it's almost horrible going to fashion shows with everybody with their phones. You know, first people were coming with their iPads, you know, and they'd be shooting, you know, if you're sitting next to somebody, you go, will not you pull the stupid thing back? You can't see anything. They would be blocking everybody's views to seeing the runway. Nobody looks at the show. They're looking at it in their hand. They're taking pictures and looking at this instead of looking at what's coming down the runway. Uh, it's, it's insane, you know, but it changed everything because now everybody in the audience was a critic. Everybody was an editor. Everybody was the jury. You know, they were sending out pictures they liked immediately. And, you know, you didn't have to wait for Women's Wear Daily to come out the next day or for Vogue to come out in three months and tell you what we saw on the runway or what the New York Times wrote about. Everybody knew. Um, and it changed things dramatically. And it's still a disruptive business now because of all this technology and the changes that that's wrought. So the, the old way of doing, all the old ways of doing things and the, uh, the magazine culture, the manufacturers, the designers, the, crit the, uh, fashion, the fashion critics, all of that has it's been affected by this, uh, the rise of the internet, essentially. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, I see it in one sense as democratization, in a sense. On the other hand, um, um, there's a business that has to figure out how to uh, satisfy all the consumer desires. And um, I don't think that uh, fashion is going to end or disappear, and shopping is not going to end and disappear totally. How, how do you think the industry will, do you see anything positive about all this change and, and, and are there? Well, I think so. I mean, I mean, we have to try to find the positive part of it. I mean, there's a lot of change. I mean, all you need to do is walk up Madison Avenue and see there are blocks where there's one store in existence and five are for rent. I mean, I've never seen so many empty storefronts in New York in my life. And that's a horrifying thing to see. I mean, and real brands and real businesses that are just shutting their doors everywhere. Um, and and that's, that's tough, you know, but people are buying, they're buying online. I think people are becoming more conscious that you don't need so much. You know, I think there's way too much out there fast fashion has kind of helped tip the scale you know of new goods coming into stores every week you know i mean it's insane how much stuff is produced and i think there's a new awareness now which um, thankfully fit is focusing on it as are a lot of other people about sustainability and how important and how detrimental the fashion community is to the planet and to the water supply and to the earth um, you know, the denim production in the world is, uh, I mean, I'm reading a book by Dana Thomas now that's coming out in, in next month called Fashionopolis about how the world is, cha how we're destroying the world with the, the fashion industry and, you know, what to do about the sustainability, which I say now sustainable is the new black in fashion. Um, so I think that the industry is learning now and is going through an educational process. You know, people are trying to figure out how to do more organic um, cottons and fibers, how to use more natural dyes and not all the poisonous indigos that are used and uh, the poisonous dyes. So I think all of this is focusing on a, on a new change. I mean, 10 years ago, you heard nobody talking about this stuff. And now it's top of the, top of the line for fashion brands and luxury brands to be focusing on it, um, on what we're wearing, what we need, how much do we need. Um, you know, the magazines, like you said, are, you know, they all look like Time Magazine now. They're so skinny. And many of them are just completely gone even already. You know, Glamour isn't even in print anymore and other books like that. Um, 
So I think we're all having to readjust. You know, fashion will never go away. You know, there's just a glorious week or two weeks of couture in Paris. You know, with everybody who's just going, you know, mouths, jaws drop about how beautiful and spectacular everything was. So, you know, there's customers for all of that. Um, you know, fashion is still something that talks to you and communicates and, and you, people love it, you know, because it, it just, that's going to change my life, that dress, that that's outfit. Right. The, and the magic of it is still there, but you have to really be clear about it. Yes, I think, in a sense, individuals now, as they express more control about the kind of people they want to be will also be able to choose how they present themselves. Yeah. You know, maybe disregarding rules somewhat or disregarding. Oh, totally disregard. I mean, the fluidity of clothing now, the, the, the men and women's clothes, you can't separate. You know, the amount of men wearing skirts and dresses and, you know, women, uh, women have always worn the pants, you know, and suits and that's never been an issue. But, um, it's fascinating to see what came out of the men's shows recently in Paris and in, in Europe. Um, people are really changed. The rules are changing. There are no rules, I guess, anymore. Um, you know, God bless Billy Porter. You know, wear a great dress if you want to wear that. You know, who says you can't? You know, who's who's calling the shots? You know, I, I've also noticed. There's an interest in ethnic expression mm -hmm. and handmade things. Well, and that's also part of the sustainable part, like um, nurturing the land and the earth and all the ethnic, um, um, you know, countries where there there are people doing the handicrafts and and weaving the fabrics and and embroidering the things and giving them work and and empowering these women and and young people to to participate and be part of the culture, part of the industry. I mean, I've always loved the ethnic clothing. I mean, that's always been my favorite stuff is all that kind of global kind of, you know, I, I don't want to say hippie because it's not, that's not the right word, but, you know, handcrafted, you know, interesting things that doesn't look like something everybody else in the world is walking down the street wearing. Yes, if we, if we can achieve prosperity and uh, have, the food we want and have shelter, we should have a right to choose handmade things to, Absolutely. to put on. And that, by doing so, we then help to preserve the culture. Yeah, no, it's so important to do that. And I so applaud the designers and companies that are working in these countries to, to do that. Right. So those are, those are some of the positive things, right? Yeah. And uh, it must be exciting outside the United States where fashion, the fashion business is very important in some of these countries. It's very important in many countries. And, you know, and one of the other things that I do now in my life in my consulting business is get involved with a lot of regional fashion weeks in America because I think that that's really something that's a lot of fun and, and very meaningful. Um, I just this summer came from the first Fashion Week in Indianapolis. It was Indiana Fashion Week. Tell us and about this. Indian, Indiana is the home state of uh, Jeffrey Bean and um, Norman Norell and Halston and Stephen Sprouse. And so there's a heritage of fashion designers coming out of that state. Um, and they, there's a young woman there who's been dreaming of doing this for years and finally got, got it together. And, you know, in, in her talks, I mean, I got an award from the governor's wife and she said, you know, for 20 years I've been following Fern on her career and, you know, always dreaming of like, I want to do this and I have to meet Fern and it took me 20 years to get her here and meet her, you know, and I, I, it was very flattering to me and it was very sweet. Um, but there were some really good designers who showed. Uh, and, I, and I've said to these designers all over the country and I, I've been involved now in Indianapolis and. Um, for many years, I've been seven years, I think, was going to Charleston Fashion Week, and uh, for several years, Nashville Fashion Week, which I uh, love everybody down there, and, um, you know, Philly Fashion Week, and I've also done Omaha, and 
Austin, not Austin, um, San Antonio, and you know, uh, various other ones that pop up, and people are always asking to get me involved in them. You know, you don't have to be in New York to be a designer. You know, there's talent everywhere in the country. You know, you can, you know, thank you, Project Runway, on one hand, they taught everybody if you could put two pieces of fabric together, you can become a designer. It's not quite that simple, but you know, there are people designing and caring about clothing everywhere. And with that thing in your hand, you can have a shop in your hand. You know, you could do a business out of Instagram online. You know, you don't need to be in Saks Fifth Avenue to, to be in business. You know, everybody doesn't need to be a billion dollar business, but they can be in the fashion business. They can make clothing for people they want to. And people find, find they, they seek it out and they find stuff. They find each other, you know. And, you know, all these young people grew up in a whole new world of this technology at their fingertips. Um, and it's, it's, it's very enabling and empowering. Well, this, this is very exciting. And I think um, positive and uh, it's, it's about sort of the future of, uh, small, of entrepreneurship and small business. Yeah. And for you, it must be gratifying uh, to, to be able to be part of it. Yeah, it's very gratifying. You know, then when you get out of town, they're so appreciative of any input and comments. And, you know, they're not so jaded as, you know, these fashion weeks in New York. It's, you know, you don't have to cut through the air with a knife. You know, it's like they're really, they're all just so nice and sweet and everybody's so friendly and, uh, you know, polite. It's really lovely. Yeah, well, this has been a, a, a wonderful way to end this, this interview because uh, you've given us some ideas about what the future may hold uh, for the fashion business. And the fashion lives, the fashion icon series continues at the 92nd Street Y and into its eighth year. Oh, good. You yes. know, and after, you know, the book which has the 19 interviews, I've, after that book came out, there's another 25 or 30 already that are, you know, 25 that are ready for the for next book, okay. you know, because since then I've done everybody from Valentino to Victoria Beckham and Leonard Lauder and, um, you know, Tim Gunn and Iman and Cindy Crawford and the Missonis and Bob Mackey, Alex Wang, Alex, Alex, Alex Wang, Bob, Bob, Zach Posen, Stan, um, Stan Herman. I'm, Lots of people. And this fall, I'm kicking off again in September with Ralph Rucci. Okay. And then, um, then I'm going to have in October Jim Moore, who was 25 years the men's fashion director at GQ, who's done a beautiful book called Hunks and Heroes. Um, and he does all the clothing now and dresses. Um, um, what's his name? The, the tennis player, you know. Um, Anna Winter's favorite tennis player, you know. Oh, come on, he's like the most famous. Andre Agassi? Huh? Andre Agassi? No. The, no. No. no, the one working now. Federer. You know. Federer, thank you. <laughs> Roger Federer, he's like, it does all of Roger's stuff. And, um, you know, and so he's, I think it'll be interesting because we haven't really talked, somebody's come up through the men's world so much. And, um, and then Amy Fine Collins, who's done a book on the best dressed list. So it'll be interesting to hear how that all evolves and happens and what that means in, in the world. Um, and then there's many more that are still on the, to be confirmed. Oh, this is great. And uh, I want to thank you for all your contributions to this. Thank video. you. Thank you. Phyllis, could I answer one question? Um, Tell us, if you will, a little bit about your work with the FIT Foundation. Okay, I'm really, um, I'm very proud of being part of the FIT Foundation board. And um, I've been kind of challenged to bring new blood and bodies to the board. And um, over the last two years, um, I think it's about two years now already, uh, you know, we've gotten um, people involved from Google, from Amazon, um, Nadja Swarovski on board. Um, you know, from IFF and the fragrance industry, we got the president of Just Play, uh, one of the biggest toy companies in America. Um, just really bringing 
um, and, a, and, a, and a terrific lawyer for the industry on board. Uh, so I've, it's been very nice working, getting new people engaged and to be, participate. And I've been working very closely with uh, the team at FIT and with Phil McCarty and um, on, on the awards gala. You know, and la a year ago, we honored Ivan Bart from IMG and Jane Huddis, who's been on the board for forever uh, from Lauder and, and um, Mike Stanley from Rosenthal and Rosenthal and had a fantastic event. And then this year, it's shifted to sustainability and dovetailed with the sustainability conference here at the school. So we've been involved in helping um, get people on um, case involved in all of those issues and, and helping them do that. And um, in fact, we have a meeting next week to start talking about next year's gala. And, you know, and I'm there for lots of different things and, and I've done a couple of talks at FIT and special programs here and I look forward to doing more and more of that. Thank you again. Thank you.